you know, very happy tonight to have Ajahn Suchito. And I'd just like to tell you a little bit about him. He's been a Buddhist monk who entered, well, he's a Buddhist monk who entered monastic life in 1975 in Thailand and who since 1978 has been based in Britain. And Ajahn is part of the Thai forest lineage of direct practice, which draws strength from an austere lifestyle lived in forests and remote places. Um, he's now based at uh, Siddha Viveka, probably not pronounced that correctly, Monastery in Chetos, West Sussex, where I had the pleasure of visiting with Annie, uh, gosh, about six months ago now, uh, where he was the abbot for 22 years. And Ajahn, which means spiritual teacher, has been teaching for 40 years as well as writing over 15 publications and leading meditation um, retreats all over the world. And we're here tonight particularly to talk about his book, Buddha Nature, which is a really comprehensive overview of many important issues connected to the environment. And on that note, I'd like to welcome you, Jean, and perhaps you could tell us about the book in your own words. Thank you, Larry. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, Paul. Well, good evening, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the book, mm, I, wrote, I wrote it three times. <laughs> I wrote it once, then I found out what I was writing about, then I rewrote it. <laughs> uh, I wrote it out of a sense of urgency, concern, worry, and I should do something. So I just started pulling things together. And when I got to the end of it, I, I saw the underlying themes and I rewrote the thing. And the underlying theme or the overarching theme, depending on where you want to put it, is the sense of this. We, we are what we experience. I will call cosmos. You may call it environment. Um, um, and it's not, of course, this means the total environment. Now, what you experience essentially comes under, I'm calling four particular categories. You experience your body presence of a body your body you live with that you experience a world of trees and sky and sun and rain you experience that you experience a, a realm of of um, mentality your thoughts your ideas you also experience a realm of a, of a collective mentality particular dogmas politics religions social structures belief systems you know including the financial system that's a belief system money is a belief system so you experience all these different environments, you know, and uh, the problem is that, they, that for most people, they don't match, to, they don't stick together. They're often in conflict with each other. And this leads to the breaking up of what should be a unified environment. I call it cosmos. You know? And one who sees and understands the unity of the cosmos, I call a spiritual being. If you, know, if you want to know what spirituality is, I would say one who understands the undivided nature of the cosmos because they're not focusing on material things they're not focusing on intellectual things they're focusing on a particular embrace of the apparent sensual external conceptual emotional you, you know the whole thing and it and they also begin to sense there is a unity here you know for a christian this would be the unity of creation god's creation yeah and i'm calling it cosmos um and so what I'm saying from an empirical point of view is that we experience these, these experiences and they're often completely divorced from each other. As we see some, some of the uh, psychologies and, and systems that we operate are completely contradictory to the nature of the, of the biosphere, which is what often we're talking about. They're often contradictory to our own neurological and emotional well-being, right? <laughs> you know, right? Uh, so people are stressed out, going crazy. And they're often not only just in conflict with each other, but they're even internally conflicted. So we see things like psychological breakdown, psychological distress, social dystopia, environmental co collapse, because there, there are so many toxic elements that are shattering the unity of the cosmos. In the, 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 the very, you could say, if you like to put it, the very, you know, uh, arteries of the cosmos are being uh, are severed or, or, or interrupted through that process. And so the healing of this is kind of the, the presentation of this uh, and the recognition of the interconnected nature of these, these realities and recognizing that the solution has to be 
to embrace the entirety. Mm. Yeah. We can't set religion apart from, you know, the agriculture. We can't set the uh, making our own livelihood or, uh, apart from our own mental health. <laughs> yeah. And so we've got to find the, put these together. And so what, what I'm suggesting is there, there's certainly, for a Buddhist, there are certain paradigms and, and uh, behaviors and practices internal and in terms of livelihood that do address this, although they can get lost under by people, you know, taking only one aspect of Buddhism. Often people like to focus on the internal meditative aspect of it. That's where we came in on, like said, meditation. Mm -hmm. True, and yet there's more to that. So, it's, it's, so I'm trying to present a way in which Buddhist teachings can be seen as at least acknowledging and giving clues as the unity and the healing of the cosmos. Mm. And I, what I also say is that, you know, I, I am not a farmer. I'm not a politician. So, but what I'm saying, is if you focus on any aspect of this fourfold cosmos and do your healing there and complete your, you are participating in the healing of the cosmos. And if you heal your own mind, your own, you know, fracturing and your own distress and your own alienation, you will automatically start to be healing the society. And if, because you're, and you're also, also automatically be start to living in a way that's more in tune with the biosphere, because that happens to be the truth. If we're whole and healthy, we, we actually, by that very fact alone, we stop messing up the bed that we're sitting in, you know, <laughs> only crazy people would actually, you know, poo in their own bed. That's what we're doing. So if you're saying you don't do that, <laughs> you know, you, you, you look out for that. And, but of course, the issue is that often we, we just, the, the systemic nature of it gives us a sense of impotence because I don't have my hands on the wheels of, of power, but I've got to start where I can you know, and work from there. So that's the kind of overview that I'm, I'm presenting in this particular in this particular book and uh, it was my offering um it took about five or six years i suppose to do but it's like you know like all of us you just put your hand onto what you can do and you do it because to not do anything at all is just the denial of our humanity we are naturally compassionate beings and we want to be compassionate and generous and so we just do it because that's the right thing to do. Mm. So this is the book, you know, there's a lot of statistics in it, which I expect will become, you know, out of date, but I think the fundamental um, uh, presentation and what I call the domination exploitation mindset pertains even as the statistics change. Yeah. So it's addressing that fundamentally is maybe one of the key topics of the book. So that's a brief overview. Excellent. Well, I'd like, there's a lot of topics that you raised and were in the book I'd like to cover. But before we start, I think it'd be really good for all of us to maybe understand a little bit about your own life journey. What brought you to becoming a Buddhist monk and then particularly your interest in the environment? Perhaps just give a. Idea well, OK, how did I become a Buddhist monk? You know, it's where does it begin? It begins with looking around and thinking, hey, this um, this is weird. We, you know, when I was a boy, we were looking at nuclear war. You know, we'd better get wiped out. I looked around when I was in living London. You could see all these bombed out buildings from the last war where we got blitzed and there were huge bomb sites. And you're looking around and think, well, OK, so what's changed, you know? And then we're talking about nuclear war. I think, good, what are we doing, you know? And then, like, we're doing this stuff where people are just working, working, working all day. My dad was working, you know, all the hours God ever sent to get a living, to get through to the next week when you do the same thing. And you think, what's all this about? Mm -hmm. This isn't addressing anything, really. I, 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 don't, I don't feel part of this. So I just couldn't really get on the, on the wagon. What do I do with my life? And nothing really lit up. So I'm thinking, there's got to be another something else. So I'm starting looking around, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll do a bit of yoga. Oh, that's different. You know, hey, spirituality, for want of a better word. Okay, so then I think, well, you know, here I am living in where I was. And then, okay, I'll head east. 
So I'm headed east because I thought that's where the spirituality was <laughs> in those days, 60, mid 60s. It was out in India somewhere. So I went to India, didn't really tune into that. And I ended up in Thailand, picked up meditation. System, oh, this is pragmatic. I can do this. It doesn't require any beliefs. Just focus on breathing in and out. I can do it. I can try and do that. I mean, it's not easy, but it's, it's something I can do. Get my head together and then I'll figure out what comes next. Well, long story short, still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> And what comes next is you start to think, well, actually, this seems to be doing, ticking a few of the boxes. You know, I'm feeling I'm doing something meaningful. I'm with good people. I'm getting my basic material requirements met. And I'm also feeling I'm performing a service. You know, someone, other people seem to benefit from monasteries and monks. This is, you know, it's, I'm leaving the world maybe in a slightly better place than when I entered it. I've done my bit. That's good enough. You know, maybe this, this was my thing. Mm. And um, in particular, what about the environment? When did you first really become aware of uh, the issues you raised in the book and the real state of our planet? Well, I think I've always been interested in it from a certain point of view because, you know, nature is always very beautiful. And I lived in London. It was such a delight to get out into some, some little bit of grass and trees. Uh, so I always enjoyed it. But then I think we had a... Um, it was going to, this was a sort of a alliance for faith in the environment, which was a kind of a ecumenical um, body that was trying to do something that would link all the religions. It was after the Assisi Declaration, the Assisi pilgrimage with the Pope and the Dalai Lama and all that. There was some sense in which the religions were going to say, hey, this is a big force in the world, religions. So there's lots of people believe in some kind of religion or other. Well, what do they all say about the environment? They say, you know, basic one form or another, look after it. So why don't we get all these people together in one unified voice to do that? So this happened in the CC, then it happened again in Canterbury. I think it's about 1983. And so I was asked to do a small presentation of what the Buddhist attitude was. So I started looking up various bits and pieces. I wrote a little booklet for that, and I did a presentation at this symposium in Canterbury. So that was 1983. And once I started looking at it, I never stopped looking at it. Mm, mm, you know, mm. and then it was pollution, you know, it was mm. like, which was bad and stuff like that. But it wasn't anywhere near as bad as, as what we began to realize over the next few decades, you know. No, definitely. And earlier you were talking about the connection between if you like our psyche and, and the environment. Do you think what we've done to the planet is a projection of our own disharmony and our own disconnection? And yep. Yeah. And perhaps you'd like to elaborate a bit on that. <laughs> well, you know, uh -huh. okay. Well, where does it begin? Yeah. It begins, I guess, when, you know human beings can abstract themselves from the rest of creation. So like, you know, if you go into deep uh, Christianity, for example, you've got a sense in which you are part of God's creation, you know, yeah, and though you've got a kind of leading role to steward it, you're definitely knitted into it. And there's a sense of respect and thanks and gratitude for God's creation, you know, and respect for it. And mm -hmm. some, some sense of that. Okay. So, but round about, you know, 16th, 17th century, it was the ability to scientific revolution where you could actually look through a telescope at it and you could think about it and you could sort of step back from it and became a thing. You could measure with instruments and devices. There's no God up there. I can't see any. There's no angels up there. It's just black space and stars. So basically the spirituality disappeared from the environment. I mean, it didn't overnight, but that was, that was the movement. Uh, and this kind of, you know, this was also encouraged through obviously Plato, you know, who started the idea, you know, that the, the, the important thing is the, the ideal world rather than the pragmatic world of nature. And then Descartes comes along who says, well, the only thing with intelligence is your thoughts and God. Everything else is just dead stuff, including your own body. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, so a huge divorce from of the thinking mind from the incarnate nature, you know, and then also the ability. Now we can dominate. Oh, we can dominate it, and we can control it. We can also exploit it. We can dig into it, 
and dig things out of it, you know, and we can chop yeah. things down. We've got machinery, the machine age, where we can conquer nature. And some of the language, which I mentioned in the book, is pretty brutal, you know, about how we can, you know, rape and destroy and nature to make us subject to our will. Mm. And, uh, and that's kind of what we did. Mm. Yeah, very much so. You talk in your book at one point um, about the difference between a mechanistic worldview and a sacred view of nature. Could you tell me more about particularly the sacred view of nature and how or can we return to that? Is it possible for us to have our cake and eat it too, to enjoy the the um, the qualities of a modern Western lifestyle, yet still feel that, that imminence in nature and that sacred connection to nature? And have you been able to do that, do you feel? Um, I think, it, you know, the modern lifestyle, it kind of really depends. I know it's a very difficult thing to, to put into words, and I appreciate what you're trying to say, but um, yes, simply speaking, because, you see, essentially, you know, I think you begin with, like, how did all this happen? Like, how did I get born? What? Well, how do I? How does a tree? And this is just a miracle. Mm. There's no. I cannot possibly create a tree. I can't create a acorn. I can't create a fungus. I can't create a fingernail. <laughs> this is all an immense, incredible, miraculous gift. Mm. I mean, like, and you don't know when. You don't know why. You don't. Know, but there it is, and you're in it. And you're part of it. And you look at the skin on your finger, and that's part of it. Yeah. Right? It's not separate. And the ability you can think, you know, and you can you can have emotions and, and all this stuff. Where does it come from? You know, like, okay, if you want to call it God, I'll call it God. But there it is. You're part of this incredible miracle. And like, and then okay, you get that wow, gratitude and mystery, like. You know, you look at the weather forecast, it's never right. <laughs> it's a complete mystery, and it happens. And then you start to get a little bit deeper. You think, look, there's nowhere else. They've not found anywhere else in the universe like this. Mm. Wow. Mm. And, hey, do you know how trees operate? Do you know what fungus does? You know the mycelial network? Wow. You know, and you know how bees work, you know, how butterflies operate. Mm. This is just fantastic. You know, like, why is this amazing intelligence, intelligence, spirit, whatever it is, mm. that's got all this is happening through? Mm. Everything is intelligent. A tree is a deeply intelligent creature. And a bee is an incredibly intelligent creature. It's got different intelligences, but it's always, um, nobody knows where it came from. But all we know is that we cannot possibly replicate it. Mm. That's what I mean by sacred. You can't yeah. buy it, you can't create it, and it's a gift. Mm. Wow. And like, can we can we regard ourselves in that way? Mm. Without being some egomaniac, like, what do I live in it? You know, and if it's sacred and a gift and irreplaceable, surely my attitude towards it must be of humility respect, love, gratitude, and care. That's sacred. And it, it, as you speak those words, I mean, I know I agree with everything you say. I feel very passionately about what you say, and I'm sure a lot of people on this uh, Zoom call will feel the same. Yet how do we nurture that feeling and overcome that other part of being human, which is a sort of inbuilt negativity bias to focus on what, what's wrong, what's missing, you know, what we don't have. And you've got obviously consumerism, the conditioning, which is very much indoctrinating us to focusing on lack and on scarcity rather than the abundance of the universe and life. Now, how have you, I, I, I guess, you know, you, you've gone on a road less travel to most of us, and how have you managed to um, develop that sacred uh, relationship to nature? And what, what advice would you give to, to the rest of us? Well, I think, you know, my, my path has come through meditation. And when I mean meditation, I mean, what do I mean by that? I mean, well, I mean, breathing in and out, which is incredible, really, <laughs> how it happens. I mean, moderating my arrogance and anger and, you know, craziness. I mean, that. I also mean totally inhabiting my embodiment. I'm not 
floating out of my head, drifting off into ideas. I can really be here, right? So I'm doing that kind of thing. When, when that happens, something starts to connect. I don't know how, it, you know, something starts to happen. Mm. Like, you know, the cliche is I feel at one with the universe, you know, and it's a corny phrase, but it happens to be sort of true, <laughs> you know, because if you're, if you're moderating your own dislocation, you know, if you're like, like a lot of people just don't really live in their bodies. Yeah. And so if you're actually moderating that and you're moderating your mental energy, so you're no longer domineering, arrogant, frightened, closing down into something that's more loving and open and embodied. Well, you know, like it's dead obvious, mm. <laughs> you know, and then you want to go out and you want to see a tree and you marvel at it and then you want to participate with it like nature. You don't want to control, you want to participate with it because it's amazing. You want to get your hands in it. Mm. You want to look after it. And that just happens. It seems pretty natural, really. And uh, that's, to me, that's how it happened. You know, mm. now it continues to happen. And like every day, you know, whatever else is going on, when I open my door, I live right, right outside my door. It's just all grass and trees. I open my door and I just think, wow. Day or night, I just, every day I open that door, I think, wow. Stars, rain, snow, wind, whatever. Wow. I mean this. Wow, you know. <laughs> Do you think you would have been able to reach this awareness and this connection to nature if you hadn't followed a monastic life? I don't know. I would hope so. I think so. I think it's it's quite natural, you know. This is very I think it's very fundamental, you know. Very basic. I think if you get to pre-mechanistic pre cultures, it's all there. You know, mm -hmm. Aboriginal people, Indigenous people, they all felt exactly the same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's because I'm a monk per se. What being a monk has helped do is helped to shelve the pressures of the modern consumer society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the frenzy of it, the, the crazy lifestyles that people have to more or less operate under to make a living, it's helped to push that away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and deal with my own dislocation, which, you know, you're born into, really. You grow up with it. You don't really know because that's, that's the norm. So being a monk has helped me to step out of that mainstream, to, to, re to return to that clarity. But I think it's not, you don't have to be a monk to do it, but it certainly gives me, gave me a lot of leverage. I don't have to go out and commute every day. I don't have to do all these frantic things, you know. And so that's that's an incredible boon, mm. but you know, I mean, you know, it, it's once you get it, you know, once you when you, you, you practice, then you know you don't have to whatever you are. It's pretty normal, really. I mean, it's interesting. During lockdown, there are a number of surveys that showed that people, because they're they're not clearly replicating the monastic life in your sense of it, but there was certainly more monastic than normal in terms of staying at home being in the garden more maybe, being more aware of nature in my local community. And I think there was a lot of hope, optimism, that that would lead to some change. But it seems that we're reverting to type again and people are all, you know, wanting to get back on planes and buy stuff and get back to the normal life. And I'm wondering if you have any advice to how we can maintain what we may be sensed or touched during that period. Well, a community, community. It's much stronger together. Mm. Even monks, we live together. We support each other by our presence and by our comradeship. And we, we, you know, which goes beyond whether you even like people or not mm. <laughs> that much, you know. But like, you, you, community is the main thing, really. One of the mm. huge supports because you just you're in this kind of mainstream flood uh, of which is hugely, you know, sloganed and and propaganda in that flood to push you on. And the, the structures in it, you know, for, to, for everything, you know, the, the economy, the economy is the main villain, in my opinion. Mm, mm. And, and the political uh, collusion with the consumer economy, you know, continues under various veils. So it's so powerful, you know, but the only thing that stands against it really is community. And the mm. bigger the community and the broader the community, the better, the more it includes every branch of, you know, human diversity. Mm. Uh, that, that's got to be, that has to be, you know, the fundamental remedy. 
kind of thought. It's interesting. We, we were listening to a podcast last week um, by Jeremy Lentz, who's uh, written a lot about these issues in the States. And he was saying that capitalism is so pervasive, it's rather like we're goldfish in water and we're not aware we're in water. We don't have a word for water because it's everything. Mm -hmm. And he even said that people can almost imagine the end of the world more easily than the end of capitalism. <laughs> because, and I'm wondering, you know, what you would suggest, What, where can we even begin to bring about the sort of systemic change that you've referred to in your book and that I think we all realise is so essential at the moment? <laughs> Oh, well, it's a small, not a small question. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you know, I think it's going to be, uh, um, as I said, community, uh, co-ops. I think essentially it's it, you have to work from the peripheries of the society. Like you go into the really uh, intense centralities, like the urban, cos co you know, uh, uh, conurbations, it's incredibly dense and permeated. You know, if you come out of the main cities into more peripheral areas, uh, you've got a little more freedom from the hypnosis of all that. Yeah. Um, and if you're, um, you, you have to be quite, uh, and then sort of starting local local cooperatives, you know, mm -hmm. would is helpful. I mean, it's maybe sound utopian, mm -hmm. but yeah. anything that's cooperative, you know. Uh, and and it, it's also fun, mm, mm. you know. Like you have people just do okay, so growing cabbages and they cabbage, you know, to put it in and say, give whatever money you like, you know. Mm. It's a, buy on trust. It's such a lovely thing to be doing mm. and uh, collecting together. Okay, in our little group in our neighbourhood, okay, we got how many cars? Can we car share? Yeah, you know, when we go to work, okay, can we car share? Can we just get together once a week and talk about how we can pool our resources? Yeah. Mm. Can we, you know, kick up a little bit of fuss in our area to try and push our MP to at least, you know, saying something, you know, or our local council? I think it, you think of, you, one has to eventually, instead of putting some voting pressure on on the political powers that be, because they don't seem to be that they they are susceptible to getting voted out of office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not, not much else, it seems. <laughs> Absolutely. In your book, and um, I know we talked about it before, but you're very uh, mindful to present Buddhism, not just as the way it's often portrayed in the West, as, you know, about meditation, about going very in, being introspective, but also referring to, you know, Buddhist activism, which has been very important around the world. And how do we reconcile, and what, what, what can Buddhism tell us about bringing back sort of inner world and our outer actions together, particularly in the context of environment? Well, I think it's really... Uh helpful to just start to, to decompartmentalize what we mean by the word meditation, which isn't really a Buddhist word anyway. It's a word we, we've, you know, brought in because it's, it's handy, you know, but uh, they talk about cultivation, the cultivation of skillful qualities, wholesomeness. And so, you know, which can include generosity, uh, compassion, sharing, um, you know, and, think, and building community. And certainly that's a big feature of what the Buddha did was establish this thing called the fourfold assembly, which meant the monks, the nuns, the laymen, the laywomen. He said, this is my final crowning piece to create a cooperative assembly that would self-moderate. And then you have such things as these, what they call the 10 parami, which are 10 particular cardinal virtues, which you cultivate, which are considered absolute important foundational cultivations generosity morality patience energy truthfulness simplicity uh, loving kindness you know honesty things like this so these then are your practice now whether you do that sitting in your room or you do it walking down the street you do it and you shouldn't you should I, you try to overcome this compartmentalization um you know into inner and outer mm because that is part of the problem. And of course, there are there is a different tonality and different energetics that occur, you know, in the in the mind that are in you know in outside. 
we could do outside, but essentially you really like, you're trying to, you know, equalize across that. So right speech, right listening, you know, mm. communication, we have the skills mm. and uh, we have the skills, but, you, and then you should just cultivate it. You just even taking, deciding you ought to cultivate right speech, right listening, right relationship with other people, mm. you know, not pushing and not telling where they should be, but listening and responding, that it's a very skillful practice. Mm. And it will benefit your own heart and the welfare of others. And as the Buddha said, you know, when I looked into my own, what I was doing, I had to consider three things. Is this good for me? Is it good for others? And is it good for all of us together? Does it lead to peace? Mm. So if it's for my welfare, your welfare, and leads to peace, it's the right path. Mm. It's not just for my welfare. It's for you know, the whole thing. If you start to divide the cosmos, you're out, you've lost the game. You've lost the plot. Mm. It'd be useful maybe just um, on that note to give us an I idea of what do you think is the fundamental message of Buddhism to us at this, at this time as we're facing environmental catastrophe, we're facing possibly nuclear holocaust, you know, what's happening in Ukraine, and, and really a very desperate time in our history. What, what do you feel we, that Buddhism can teach us right now? <laughs> um, hmm. Pay attention. Uh, cause and effect. Everything that happens arises from causes. Hmm. Don't be surprised, you know. We think we got rid of war in 1945. <laughs> Dream on. You know, everything rises from causes. The principal truth of the Buddha Dharma, Buddha Dharma is everything that you can see, hear, touch, think of, arises from particular causes and particular effect. Look at the causes. Look at the causes of Ukraine. Look at the causes of South Korea, of North Korea. Look at the causes of what's happening in Yemen. You know, what is it? Look at the causes. Greed, fear, rage, resentment, you know, discrimination, whatever but it's coming from, from that. Look at the causes. Stop blaming other people and, and, and dropping bombs on the symptoms. Look mm. at the causes. You know, mm. you can't bomb people into peace. Mm. Mm. That's very true. Okay, I've just got a question in chat come up from Robin and Vicky, and I'll read it out. I identify with what you're saying about community and cooperatives, but does that ultimately only benefit oneself and community? And does a deep connection with nature that many of us share only serve to hide the horrors of capitalism that will ultimately destroy humankind? I suppose what I'm saying is what benefit to our earth and impending climate destruction can we hope for? <laughs> Here goes, nice light question. I <laughs> just love it. <laughs> um... I wouldn't hope and I wouldn't despair. <laughs> I'd say you just put your hands in the ground and do what you can because it's worthwhile doing. And, uh, you know, you'll feel the benefit, you'll be of some benefit, and who knows? Mm -hmm. now, you know, if you look at the big picture, you just get, you just get kind of totally traumatised by it all, and that doesn't do you any good. Yeah. I mean, this is something we've been talking a lot about and you know, I've been feeling acutely recently is, you know, the news from the IPCC, the news about the Amazon being destroyed 500% faster than it was before lockdown, that carbon emissions are rising at a faster rate than any other time. You know, it's all terrible news. And I've, I've been working in this field 25 years and I've seen, you know, people are saying this is our last chance every year for 25 years. I mean, how do you deal with that what advice would you give to us in terms of how we deal with that psychologically and emotionally yeah well paul i think um i think you've got to be um prudent in how much you can manage how much input you can manage before you get start getting traumatized by it all and just depressed um I think you've got to, that's one thing I think one has to keep a, obviously a perspective, but, you know, eventually it's just, there's so much you can actually emotionally handle. You know, mm -hmm. now we are, now we've got all the massive media, we can in, inherit that, we can tap into the horror of the entire planet 
and we don't actually have necessarily a, a sister heart or even a neurological system that can manage that. Mm. Mm. It's very true. You've got to be prudent about that. And then you've got to be able to, to just say, okay, well, let's deal with the fear. Let's deal with the worry. If you're not frightened and worried, there's something wrong with you. You should be frightened and worried. There's nothing wrong with you. That's totally normal. But what how would I deal with that right now? You know, that's kind of what I call spiritual practice, mm. meditation, mm. however you want to call it, prayer. I deal with that. Mm. That's certainly the first thing to deal with. Um, mm. Rage comes next. <laughs> Guilt, I should have done more. Can I, you know, switch my lights off or whatever? You know, you do these little things you can do, which are mm. puny, but you do your bit and you realize I just got to stop feeling mm. guilty about it or that doesn't do it good either. No, that's true. So, I know in, sorry. So, and then you've got to kind of develop loving kindness, really, mm. you know, loving kindness and, and just kindness for yourself, for anything. Uh, because you've got to you've got to keep going, you know. You've got to keep going. Mm. Do you think that um, I know in psychology there's a term called spiritual bypassing, where people use spirituality as a way of avoiding the emotional work that needs to be done, um, whether it be in therapeutic context or even dealing with anxiety, depression, fear. They, you know, through meditation, it's a way of escaping, if you like, from their emotional life. And how do you? What, what are your views on that? And how can we prevent that so that it's not just an escape or a recreational activity? <laughs> um, well, I guess it's how you meditate, really. Um, you know, if you use a lot of concentration suppression practices or you lose a lot of sublimation, like you're kind of believing in something or just, you know, putting images into your mind, so you kind of, or, or a lot of idealism, or particularly a lot of, you know, concentrating the mind is narrowing onto a focal point, um, then that's certainly a way, or just going off into some kind of ide ideological spin. Those are those are the typical strategies that, that people do, you know, can do. But if you stop doing that and just become more embodied, aware, mm. then, you know, your body and your emotions are running in the same channel. Your, your emotions are embodied. Mm. If you come really into your body, you, you begin to you'll feel your emotions and they'll be probably pretty uneven and rocky and swaying. And, uh, and then you just start, you've got to start working with that. Uh, you won't, you won't um, bypass anything. You, didn't, you don't really bypass anything. You just push, it, push the problem down the road a bit. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a phrase that really interested me in your book, and you talked about the happiness of renunciation, but less is the new more. <laughs> I'd be interested particularly to know your experience of renunciation and what you lost, and even more importantly, what you gained from it. Yeah, um, well, renunciation is a pretty kind of heavy word once you get all those syllables. <laughs> I call it sim simplification, uncluttering, uncluttering. That's, that's a nice way of looking at it. Take the clutter out. Uh, accessing authentic needs. Yeah. Accessing authentic, right at the root. I need happiness. Mm -hmm. I don't actually need football, but I need happiness. Yeah. I don't need, you know, <laughs> entertainment. I do need happiness. Just get yeah. down to the root of it. Okay. So then you think, okay, well, actually, you know, Sometimes football, but right, but that's actually just one. Can I get down to the root of it, right? Rather than just going off to these various things which don't actually bring around results I'm looking for. Mm. And that's kind of what got me there because I did all the things you know, you did as a young person to 25. I've done all of it, really. I mean, in, I think this isn't getting me, this isn't taking me where I want to go. I'm just getting more and more cluttered and busy and mm. frantic and bored and restless. And there's this sense of I've got to, I feel like I'm oversaturated like a sponge. I need to squeeze the sponge just to empty out. Mm. Less density, less frenzy, less grasping, less dependence on this and that and the other. Mm. And that was the, the ability to be independent. 
And for a while, it was a bit like, you know, like coming off of drugs or something. You get a bit twitchy <laughs> and withdrawal symptoms. But then you mm. start to feel clean. Hey, this feels good, you know. This feels really good. I, I, I can live light. I can live light. I don't need a lot of stuff to keep me going. And that's, that feels great, you know, mm. that, 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 that clarity. And so, you know, that, that's kind of how it happened for me. Mm. Um, um, you know, we some, but I mean, and so I just took it where where I could. I took it. Uh, I followed my own disposition, and it grew. First of all, I thought I could never do without, you know, sex, music, and, and, but I, I can without going crazy. I could. Bit of a struggle at first, but yeah, I could. Mm-hmm. And then, well, I couldn't do without even eating in the evening. That's impossible. I starved to death. I struggled. Mm-hmm. I could. I could do without it. No, but yeah, it's great to feel free. <laughs> I was just trying to imagine life about football, actually, so I was struggling a bit. But uh, we'll, 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 that's well, another discussion. <laughs> it's, it's a long, it's a big job. Life without football, but it can be done. <laughs> there are people who've lived healthy lives without football. So, what does happiness mean to you in ev- in your everyday life? What, what... I suppose happiness to me means uh well happy heart that's what my name means actually <laughs> uh good heart it means no regret mm. it means no resentment it means no guilt no fear uh it means that i, I mean so integrity you know I, I live with integrity okay i may lose it please tell me when i do but i, I aspire to integrity that makes me feel good uh i i share whatever i can I, I love to share things. That makes me feel good. Um, I don't have any. I don't have any enemies. That makes me feel. I've got no resentment and grudges. That makes me feel good. Mm. You know? And you know, so and I can sort of get open, open them all a day and think it's a new day, start again. I'm not on the wheel. That makes me feel good. I get to the end of the day, I can put it down. I'm not steaming over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes me feel good. It's a cleansing process because to my mind, to my experience, the heart is naturally happy. It is a happy experience. Mm. It's just it gets cluttered up with fears and needs and stuff like that and obscures a happiness that's very fundamental. Mm. And that to me is very special because we're always trying to add something to ourselves to make us happy. Mm-hmm. That's why renunciation sounds like crazy, you know, like it's bad enough already. You know, you're going to give it up. Mm-hmm. No, no, because once you come down to the true heart, it is happy. That's its nature. Mm-hmm. And it's it's very interesting because um, in my field, positive psychology, there's been a huge amount of research over the last 20 years, which really substantiates what you're saying, that happiness comes from meeting our authentic needs for health, for meaning, for purpose, for community, right, right. as opposed to our inauthentic needs for status, wealth, yeah. you know, possessions, consumer goods, etc. Yet yeah. we've constructed a society that's predicated completely almost on inauthentic needs, and we've lost Absolutely. the soul. Absolutely. And, you know, how can we get back to that? Is it possible? Is it too late? I mean, how do you feel about this? <laughs> well, I think for some people it's too late, maybe too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much a you know I, don't, I wouldn't like a blanket statement about the entire human species, but I don't think it's the, too late for everyone. You know, people do, and if you you start getting like what really matters, you know, what really matters. So you ask yourself at the beginning of the day, what is the most important thing? You know, mm-hmm. and maybe if I had to reduce it to one or two things, what would I take? Okay, I take you know uh, freedom from fear or mm. something like that okay so you realize most of your act most of ordinary people's actions are sublimations as you say of mm. fundamental needs mm. can i name what those fundamental needs are in in five sentences three sentences even better right mm. Mm. so then you say well actually now why do i need that why do i need happiness because i'm not happy what's getting in the way mm. can i remove something that's getting in the way yeah and, so you, and then they really need pragmatic skills to do that. There, there's the rub, you see. Mm. Now, I, got, I don't know. So much I don't know. 
you know, but there's certainly there's people into therapy, there's people into all kinds of spiritual, psychological stuff who provide skillful means. I got a set, one set of toolkit to do some of this work. And it works to a degree for a good proportion of people. It's not, you know, it's it's a tool system. It's a system and it does work. Uh, and it does bring around benefits. So that's what I can do. But it's fundamentally, you know, it's not about belief. It's about using tools to release the obstacles to your own well-being and to find out what really matters to you, what mm -hmm. really matters to you, not what you what you've been told matters to you, what you've been trained to make matter to you, what you've been told is the most important thing in the world. You stop, get off the script. You know, you look around and see, okay, we're all the happy people. They're all going nuts. You know. They're all going crazy, mm. <laughs> chasing still, happiness. You know. You, do you still have that sense that you you referred to when you first became a monk that there, the world is insane and you're observing this insanity, this busyness, this crazy habitual behaviours which are increasing? You know, depression is going to be the biggest um, cause of morbidity by 2030, according to the uh, World Health Organization. Do you think that's a symptom of this, this madness or almost yeah, of the system? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah, it's absolutely, because it's, you know, it's systemic and it's uh, neurological and it, it just damages people with neurochemicals. This is not just about people being a bit flaky in their hearts. This is neurological damage. It intoxifies the environment, so you're actually absorbing all kinds of damaging chemicals. Uh, and as a, the social dystopia is deeply depressing, you know, because human beings, as empathetic creatures, need to feel empathically connected to the people around them. Mm. Mm. If that's not happening, they're going to start going a little bit strange, mm. you know. So yeah, um, do I think the world is crazy? I think I think I've become slightly less <laughs> broad brush. I think there's a lot of craziness in it, but I'm also really so pleased and so touched and delighted by the beauty in human beings, and the generosity and the love and the patience and the incredible resilience of human beings. There's a lot of good there. There's a lot of good there. Uh, um, it, it, you know, but um, but you know, I, I want to say that. But I would say that you know of, that the main drivers of the human uh, social sphere are deeply deranged. <laughs> Do you think it's getting worse? Um, I think it's. <laughs> I think the thing is that the the, the machinery is so much more powerful now. Mm. You know, if you were a berserk dictator in, in 1266, you might have, you know, done a few people in, but now you can blow up an entire planet. <laughs> I know. Well, that's right. Very appropriate thought at the moment, definitely. It's, uh, as we're coming towards the end, if anyone has any questions, please put them in, in chat. Um, is there a particular practice, maybe not just meditation or mindfulness, that you would encourage us to do to deepen our connection to nature and, and break out of the, the sort of the sleep, the trance of modern life, if you like? Well, hmm. <laughs> yeah. I do chanting mm. uh, because it's this embodied. And with the chanting, you really are you know putting something out so you know the chanting and blessing the world mm. blessing blessing the world around you and certainly and doing things like qigong is very helpful particularly if you go out into nature because that the qigong moderates your own energies so you energetically get much more connected mm. so i do things like qigong yoga chanting uh, walking just just walk Mm. Without going anywhere in particular, just go out for a walk and feel your body swinging along, ground underneath you, you know, sky above you, space around you. Just you're doing that, you know, and you start to feel good, and, you, and what? Then you love it, mm. and when when you love it, you'll do things for it. It's natural. If no. you don't get into it, you won't love it. Very true. You'll think about it and worry about it. You won't love it. And love is the healer. Mm. Love is the healer. Mm. You know, every, whatever word you want to put around those, how you want to interpret those four letters, mm. half is the healer. No, definitely. One final question has just come through here. Um, 
capitalism has given us Zoom, mobile phones, so that we can enjoy a talk like tonight and have people from the States and everywhere mm. um, to listen to this. Yet, is there a way in which we can have a less technological future where we're not as impacted by social media, a lot of the other problems we talked about, but we can still accommodate multiple viewpoints and still have the sort of uh, event we've had tonight. What's the right balance, do you feel? <laughs> to know, yeah, yeah, well, you're, you're got, your own body will tell you. <laughs> you know, your nervous system will tell you. Uh, I can't tell you, but your nervous system will tell you. And you tune into where, you know, you can stay, you can stay, stand in, be in your own body, listening to others, mm -hmm. don't get lost in the screen. And there may be different percentages of time for different people. Mm -hmm. You know, I would also sort of challenge the idea that capitalism gave us the Zoom. I think technology gave it to us. And mm -hmm. one way in which we harness technology was through a particular economic system called capitalism. Mm -hmm. But what I really find fault with capitalism is the huge amount of, of money just made out of investment and moving moving finance around, not out of technology itself, mm -hmm. but out of the, 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 the credit system, mm -hmm. you know, which means you can make money out of nothing. Out of shifting a debt around, you can make money. Mm -hmm. You can make money by, by servicing a debt. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing is debt. There is not enough money. The whole world is run on debt, on moving debt around, and you can make money out of it. Mm. That's right. what I mean by, and then actually it sounds like it's theoretical, but the bottom of the line is some guy in you know, Bangladesh is suffering because of that. Mm. Mm. No, definitely. <laughs> the banking system. And yeah. In fact, the banks can, can loan money they don't have. No, absolutely. And, and, um, and, and fenced off, and, you know, and what this called is the offshore banking and this kind of, you know, secret accounts so that you can live in a country, use the resources, you know, use the police force, use the legal systems, drink the water, breathe the air, and not pay the proper tax, mm -hmm. not pull your weight, and you're making billions. That's what I mean by capitalism. Like the Chancellor's wife today, as we were further in the news, <laughs> we'll get into that one. Um, and it's like, it's just so rife, you know, it, yeah, it, it's it so, and so shameless. I couldn't agree more. One very final question. Do you think that technology and social media has increased our disconnect with each other and nature? <laughs> Following on from the last. Well, again, it's how you use responsible use. You know, it's like uh, every new thing we invent or create, we have to also upgrade our responsibility to mm -hmm. use it. Mm -hmm. You know, when they invited, when they invented the wheel, they probably thought, oh, the wheel, you know, my goodness, what's going to happen now? But if you use the wheel responsibly, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so if you were to spend your day on a, on a phone doing Twitter, mm -hmm. then it's probably, you know, you, and just relating to people like that, that's not mm -hmm. responsible, you know. So you've got to, you know, how you use these things responsibly, responsibly uh, and, uh, you know, and so that every every th new thing is a new challenge. You know, mm. to, to to how we handle it rather than be handled by it, mm. because we're like kids. You get a new gadget, you know, you get totally absorbed in the glitter of it, and it's like, wake up! You know, you are the most important thing. Your heart is the most important thing. This is just going to help it. Don't let it supplant it. Mm. Right. excellent. On that note, um, and it means you've got to learn to do without, you know, yes. which is a really, really difficult thing for our human nature to say, I will do without mm. something that could be fun. I will do mm. without. That's what I mean, renunciation. And you hit that thing where, you know, your, your emotional instincts or your, your whatever is libido says, oh, yum, yummy, yummy, you mm. know, but you've got to say, well, yeah, I, hope, I know the message. That's how I how come I'm three stone overweight. <laughs> <laughs> that goes all the way down the line you know you've got to, be able to say no i don't have to have everything i can just say there is a word called enough yes enough yes. use it a lot i'm good enough mm. i have enough you know mm. and it means i'm going to have not everything that's possibly available and the best and the newest and use that word then you're going to be sane Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sam. That was, I really, really enjoyed that talk. And I encourage everyone to get a copy of the book. Um, 
And if you look in chat, uh, copy the link there of how to find it, or you can get in touch with Annie, that, that email address to, to get a hardback version. It's a profound book. It's comprehensive. It deals with the connection between our inner life and the systems, all the things we've talked about tonight. If you really want to explore that, I encourage you to read it. And I'm just going to hand over to Dawn now. Tell us can about I, Can I just oh, say yes, please. Just yeah. a short word? If you hear the word monastery, don't think of some enclosed order. There is no gate. Our driveway has no gate on it. Come in. You yes. can come in and wander around the grounds. You don't have to join anything, pay anything, talk to anybody, be a card-carrying Buddhist. You just come in and wander around the grounds and have a pleasant hour or two. It's open. Mm. Please. It's a beautiful place. Thank you. I'll just hand over to Dawn now. Tell us about the next uh, Green Books event. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, so our next Green Books event is on Thursday the 9th of June at 7.30, when Paul will be interviewing um, Shamash Alidina, who is one of the leading experts on mindfulness in the UK. He's written six books, including the very successful book, Mindfulness for Dummies. And the talk will cover the practice of many <laughs> benefits of mindfulness, relaxation, and how the mindful connect a mindful connection to nature can improve our physical and mental health. Um, to book tickets, you'll be able to do that online um, on the events page of Greening Stenning in the next few weeks. And we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, well, thanks to everyone for attending what's well, been a wonderful evening. And um, we'll hope to see you in June. And we'll be covering a lot of these uh, issues, which I think are so important right now. Uh, mental health, physical health, mindfulness. And, and but particularly, I think the message of Buddhism, which is needed more than ever right now. So I thank you. Great. Thanks, Paul. Great thing to be doing. And good luck, and good fortune and blessings to you all. And, you know, please come visit whenever you can. Thank you. It's a beautiful place. Really encouraging.